Hey everybody, I'm Brandon Graisley. I'm a high school computer science teacher. We're working on our space shooter game and we are going to use an explosion this time. So if you head over to opengameart.org slash content slash explosion, you'll see this uh, public domain. There's the license down here, public domain explosion sprite sheet. It is a four by four uh, grid. So 16 tiny images all um, laid out in a single large uh, image and we're going to use this one down here the one that's kind of uh, got a transparent background so download that and uh, put it into your assets folder I called mine explosion.png and uh, you can call it whatever you like then that's helpful for me now you could put it into the image atlas and redo all that but uh, I'm not going to do that right now so if you want to go ahead and work on that you can uh, but this is going to work out just fine um, the way we're going to do it here so uh, we have a few things to add, so we're going to need in the graphics section of our, this is, sorry, this is in the game screen class, I'm up in the field variables, I'm going to need to make a private texture called, I'm going to call it the explosion texture. I just need one because I'm going to use the same texture for all of my explosions. And new texture and explosion.png. Actually, I suppose what I should do is let me just cut that out. So there's the declaration of the field variable. I'll go down in here, maybe right after the background stuff. Uh, okay, we have all the player textures and so on. Explosion texture is that. Okay, so we have our explosion texture ready to go. Uh, this is just that single large image. It's not chopped up into its little individual components yet. yet. Uh, the other thing we're going to need is a linked list for this. Yep, because we could have multiple explosions at the same time. So let's make a linked list of mm, explosion objects. Those don't exist yet. We're going to have to make those. Um, and then I'm going to call it explosion list. So let's start by writing the explosion class, and then we'll come back and decide all the different places that we need to use it. So back to my project tab out of the Android area and into the core area. It's important that you're here, core Java. Here's the space shooter package. Create a new Java class. And I'm gonna call this one explosion. And we don't need anything else there. So it doesn't have anything in it yet. And we're gonna write a bunch of stuff and then we'll go back to game screen and use it. So animations in libgdx, it's, there's an animation class and the way we are going to use it is this so we're going to make a private oh, animation it takes a texture region as the um, uh, generic type that goes right there now there are other ways to do this but this is the only one i've ever done so i'm going to use this approach we're also going to need a floating point number that you guessed that is the explosion timer. We've done this timer kind of thing a whole bunch of times. One more thing, we're gonna need a private rectangle or you could do like X, Y with height, uh, the libgdx one. That will look after the bounding box for the explosion. Okay, and basically what we're gonna do is copy the bounding box from a ship and the explosion will be the same size as the ship. That'll be our approach for this time. Okay, let's make a constructor. It takes a texture uh, it's going to take a rectangle, uh, bounding box, and we're going to need one more float, and that's going to be the total animation time. So like two seconds or 1.5 seconds or those kinds of things. Um, this dot bounding box will be equal to the bounding box. So it's just passed in as a parameter. So the next thing we need to do is take that texture, which has all of its little images built into it, and we're gonna chop it up into um, something smaller, and that's called splitting the texture. So we're gonna do that first. And after that, we're gonna convert that texture to a one-dimensional array that we can use with our, um, with our animation. So splitting the texture happens like this. Texture region, two-dimensional array, and I'm going to call it texture region 2D. We're going to get a 1D in a bit. So we take the texture region class and we call this static method. So you notice the texture region is that's the name of the class, not an object. And I call split and I have to give it a texture, tile width, and tile height. Now the texture is the one that we were passed in. The tile width um, for my particular one is 64 pixels and it has a height of 64 pixels. 
So if you take 64 times 4, so that'd be 256, that's the width of my image because it was divided into four sections. Each one uh, has a tile width of 64. Now this is specific to my particular image. If yours is different, you'll want to do something different. In fact, you could ask the texture, how big are you? And use those numbers here divided by uh, four, if you know it's a four by four texture. So now let's go to the work of converting to a one-dimensional array. So let's make a one-dimensional array. Texture region 1D. New texture region array. Now the size of this is going to be 16, 4 by 4 in this particular case. You, if yours was different, you could put something more dynamic here as well. And let's see, I'm going to need an overall index to keep track of uh, how far into the one dimensional array I am. And I'm just going to use a nested for loop here. So if you've never done this before, this might be, this is worth seeing, I guess. I'm hard coding all of my numbers because I know exactly how big my uh, image is here. Again, something more dynamic might be smart if you've, especially if you've never done this before. Um, okay, so my overall index, I'm at position zero of this array, and I'm at position ij of the two-dimensional array. And so I want the texture region one-dimensional version at index. Um, index to be equal to the texture region two-dimensional array at i and j. Okay, and then I want to do index plus plus. So every time we go to the next one of these, I'm increasing index and moving over one spot at a time. This index plus plus can be a separate command like this. You can actually also put index, you can put the plus plus right there if you want. It'll add to index after this line is finished. But anyway, this works well. So all of this takes the two dimensional array and converts it into a one dimensional array. There are other ways to do this. You could even, for example, write your own split method, your own version of this that will copy into the one dimensional array immediately. In fact, because libgdx is uh, open source, you can click on, or rather control click on the split method, and it'll show you how it works. It uses the uh, this other split method, and if you head there, you can see exactly how it works, and you could write your own version that doesn't go through the trouble of making a two-dimensional array. So we have our one-dimensional array, and now it's time to stuff it into the animation object. So the animation object, explosion animation, sorry, let me scroll a little bit, um, will be a new animation that takes a texture re region as its uh, sort of list type. Each little section of it is a texture region. Now it takes some parameters. It needs to know the how long is a frame. So a frame for us is the total animation time divided by 16. Sorry, I've got a whole bunch of stuff on the screen. Let me make that easier to see. So the frame duration is the total time divided by the number of frames. So 16 is the number of frames for this animation. And then it actually needs the list itself. So that's the texture region one dimensional version. Uh, last thing, the explosion timer should be zero. I can't remember if I did that above. I did not. So there, we've set it to zero and it's ready to go. Now we need a few methods in the explosion class besides. We need the public void update type method which will take the delta time in as a float, and all it does is um, increments the explosion timer by that much. The very same as we did with lasers and other things. Um, it's going to need a draw method. It takes the sprite batch, just like we've done before. Um, so it's going to need to draw the correct frame of the animation. Um, so that'll be batch.draw explosion animation dot now get keyframe is the uh, is the one that we want and you put in the state time now that's the explosion timer that we've made here uh, and then you there's a looping option there but I think by default it does not loop so I should be able to leave that alone now for drawing so we've basically retrieved a rectangular image we need to say where to put it 
And so I'm going to do that down here. And I just pressed enter so it's easier to read. Bounding box dot x, bounding box dot y, uh, bounding box dot width, and bounding box dot height. Now again, you could have used um, x, y, width, height as parameters to your explosion, but I liked the idea of just passing in a single rectangle because uh, I think that's tidier. So there, we've drawn the correct image. That's the get keyframe part at the correct location. That's it for draw. And we need one more. We need to be able to ask the uh, animation, are you finished yet? So that's a Boolean. Yes, no, true, false. Are you finished? And so we're going to return a value. And I'm going to put it in brackets to make it easier to see. Uh, I don't know if that'll be easier to see. Maybe not. Explosion animation dot is animation finished. And then you give it the explosion timer for it to check itself. So if the timer has gone beyond the, it'll be the uh, total animation time, because that's 16 times the frame duration, then this will return uh, true to say, yes, it's finished. And we will return true back to the place that's calling this. OK, so our explosion objects are ready to be created. Let's head back to game screen and make that happen. You can see our list is now happy because it has an explosion um, data type or, or class to work with. So let's see all the different places that we're going to need to use this. So render explosions is a big one. We're going to need an iterator. Big surprise. List iterator explosion. Explosion list iterator. Explosion list dot, uh, what's it called? Dot list iterator. There we go. And then we'll say while explosion list iterator dot has next explosion, let's call it E, I'll call it explosion, equals explosion list iterator, oops, list iterator dot next. So we've retrieved the current explosion. Maybe there'll be like three or four on the screen at once. And we can do this. If explosion dot is finished, so if it's done already, then we want to remove it. So that would be explosion list iterator dot remove. That removes the one that we just retrieved. Otherwise, so else, we want to draw it. Explosion dot draw, and we have to pass it the batch. Uh, and that's a field variable in this class, so it's available to us. Uh, and that's all. So we check to see if it's done. If it is, get rid of it. If it's not done, go ahead and draw it on the screen. Now. We haven't made any explosions or created any yet. That happens when uh, collisions are detected. So go to the detect collisions method. And we want that to happen whenever a ship should be destroyed. Now that will happen here when the enemy ship is hit with a laser. I'm going to make a design decision here. I could write a method in the enemy ship class like is destroyed or something like that. But instead, I'm going to reuse or, or add some functionality to this hit method. So let's go and take a look at that. Control click will take you there. Now, this is in the ship class, not the enemy ship class. Um, I'm, just, I'm just going to change this void, re, no return type, and I'm going to make it a Boolean. OK, so right now, there is no nothing being returned yet. So you can see there's a, a little error here that you haven't returned anything. Basically, when it's hit, if the ship is destroyed, I want to return true. Now, that's not clear from the name of the method, so maybe I should rename it. Uh, so like check, hit and check if destroyed, something like that. I will add that in there. Hit and check destroyed. Sure, it's clear now. It's a really long name. So if the shield was greater than zero, we reduce the shield. And in that case, it should not be destroyed, right? So that would be return false. But if the shield was uh, zero and the ship was hit, then we want to return true. The ship should be destroyed. So there's no need to reduce the shield, but we're going to return true to say that it was destroyed. OK, and I did that in the ship class, which means it will work for both the enemy ships and the player ships, since they're both subclasses. Let's head back to game screen. So this method, you can see it's now renamed. It returns a boolean. So now I can use if. So if enemy ship hit 
and check destroyed. Okay, so if that's true, that is if it was destroyed, then we want, we're going to want to do some things. In our case, we want to remove the enemy ship from the list. It's gone. And then you can see also we're going to remove the laser no matter what happened. So the enemy ship list iterator dot remove, get rid of this particular enemy ship. So this line will only run if the enemy ship was actually destroyed, not just if it was hit. But the laser is removed either way, and the break statement happens either way, which breaks us out of the enemy ship looking to see if a laser hit it, so we can look at the next laser. Okay, the other thing we want to do when the enemy ship is removed, we want to make an explosion. So explosion list dot, oops, add new explosion. Now an explosion takes some parameters. Let's go remind ourselves what those are. Texture a bounding box, and the animation time. So the texture is the explosion texture. The bounding box is going to be the enemy ship dot bounding box. Now the enemy ship will be removed from the list here in a moment. And so it might be safe to just use this bounding box as is, as a rectangle, but instead I'm going to make a new rectangle that is essentially a copy of that rectangle because I don't want to um, make a mistake and have you know have my explosion start moving around the screen or something like that. Uh, and then the last thing we need is the uh, is it the time? Yes, the total animation time. And I'm going to do like 0.7 seconds. Maybe we're going to put your F there for a floating point number. So maybe just make this a little easier to read. And there. So explosion texture, a new rectangle that's a copy of the enemy ship bounding box, and the total animation time. You can see I can still use the enemy ship reference here even though it's been removed from the list. That enemy ship reference is still good. Uh, very shortly though that uh, enemy ship object will be cleaned up by the garbage collection. Okay so we now have explosions. Um, I think we might be ready to go. Let's try it out. We have a crash. Let's see what happened. Null pointer exception. All right. Uh, render explosions. Oh, I bet we didn't initialize the explosion list. That makes sense. So that would have had to happen way up at the beginning. So we made the explosion list. Yeah, yeah, here it is. It's uh, never assigned. You see how it's in gray there? Uh, I should have noticed that warning. Uh, where was I making my other lists? Here's some other lists. Let's make one right here explosion list equals new it's a linked list and you just put the diamond operator and then the brackets there okay let's try again well the explosions are not progressing the way i wanted them to looks like i'm getting the first frame only so we must have another little problem let's go see what i did wrong here excellent video right guys okay the explosion timer is in oh that's it right there once again with in gray the uh, update method was never called so we remember to call our render explosions method, but we didn't tell the explosions to sort of make progress. Now we did that up above with other things. Uh, we called player ship .update, enemy ship .update, but we didn't uh, ask the explosions to update. So let's go down to that method. Um, we grabbed the explosion, but we didn't tell it to update. And that's why we needed delta time. You can see once again, it wasn't used here. So explosion .update with delta time. Uh, and I might even rename this to update and render explosions. Update and render explosions. There, that way I, I know that I've looked after both. Okay, I think we've got all the boo-boos out of the way. Let's see. Okay, so we have our animation working now. I just want to try to get a couple of these guys on the screen at the same time. I can maybe destroy both of them so I get two animations happening at once. I think what I'll do actually is make them appear more quickly. So let's go to the very top and change the uh, the frequency with which enemies are spawned. Uh, let's see. Time between enemy spawns. Let's make that every second. That'll be nice and fast. Because I want to try to get 
several explosions happening at once. So there we go. So we're confirming that all of the explosions can uh, happen sort of at different rates and everything like that. Okay, it looks pretty good. I'm, I'm uh, absorbing a lot of laser fire at the moment. So our last step, I suppose, is to make sure that when the player ship is destroyed, that um, we get an explosion there. So let's go back to the detect collisions method. So we just finished the enemy ship explosion stuff, and I'm going to take that bit of code right there, how we made the explosion, and let's go find out whether the what happens when the player ship gets hit as well. So that was if the player ship was destroyed, then we're going to need to do something. Um, the, the enemy ship, it'll be player ship. Oops. And I think I would like to make the explosion a little last a little bit longer, maybe like twice as long. Actually, I'm going to do uh, here. Let's do 1.6 seconds. Uh, that way, every animation frame will take 0.1 seconds. So if the player ship was destroyed, then we do that. I'm just going to make one more change. Um, when the player ship gets destroyed, I want to. I'm just going to do a little hack and reset the uh, shield on the player ship to 10, just so it's starting over again. Um, of course, you wouldn't just straight up do that in a, in a real game, but for now we're going to do that. We'll worry about the uh, um, what happens when the player dies in a little bit, so let's run it and try it. Okay, let's get shot a bunch there. You saw a uh, Laser hit me there, I have no shield, and now there's the explosion and my shield is back. So for now, that's what we have, and uh, I think next time we're going to move on to making a heads-up display, showing a score, showing how many lives are left, showing the current shield strength, that sort of thing. Okay, so that one had a couple of little mistakes in it that we got to troubleshoot through, so hopefully that was educational for you, and uh, we've got at least one more video left, so stay tuned next time for the heads-up display. Thanks.